Hello and welcome to our expert roundtable discussion, Financing Net Zero. For businesses, governments and individuals, there is no debate about the urgent need to cut CO2 emissions, reduce global warming to 1.5 degrees C and mitigate the devastating effect climate change will have on the planet. But how we reach net zero goals is a conversation still being had at boardrooms, government headquarters and dining room tables around the world. The reality is that everyone has a key role to play. Joining me virtually to tackle this topic is Hans Stotter from AXA IM Core, Maria Mendeluce from We Mean Business and Helen Clarkson at Climate Group. Welcome, everyone. Hans, I'm going to start with you. Why is investing in sustainability important for the foreseeable future? I think the challenges of our time are very significant, uh, both from an environmental and social aspect. And I strongly believe that sustainable finance can be a catalyst for good in dealing with these challenges. Sustainable finance basically means that we would be allocating capital to companies, governments, projects uh, that take uh, a positive action, while of course, at the same token, withhold capital from companies and governments and projects that are not taking positive action towards solving the challenges of our time. And um, I think it is important that we, in that, align uh, a financial outcome with a positive societal outcome. So... The point being that uh, if you have a, a very attractive return to build up a large pension, it would be helpful to have a world worth living in to enjoy that pension. When it comes to reaching net zero, what do you see as having a bigger impact? Is it policies, investment or individuals? Well, I think individual action and, and individual business action can uh, bring us to some some somewhat somewhere right uh, but it's still at the moment it is voluntary individual action if we want this to bring from the what i call the thousands of companies oh, or the thousands of, of individuals that are committed doing voluntary action and we, we need to bring it from the thousands to the millions because we need millions to be engaged and to do something on climate change then regulation is the best instrument to, to bring this to light. The recent geopolitical events that are occurring at the moment, are they having any implications for the transition to net zero? Yeah, I think when, it, when the war in Ukraine broke out, there was a sort of initial, you know, the fossil fuel companies were straight in there, um, sort of taking advantage. We saw things happening in the US and actually in the US things were already sort of moving in the other direction. Like we've got to drill more, we've got to release uh, you know, from the from the National Reserves and so on. Actually, from European governments, you saw this kind of initial kind of the naysayers um, coming out. So I think there was a real moment of fear at the beginning of the Ukraine crisis of like, this is going to set everything back. Now we're seeing a more nuanced and interesting response to that. And I'm hopeful that, you know, in some governments, they will see that actually a shift to renewable power is the better, um, a better way through these sorts of crises. And Hans, how does this current situation affect sustainable investing? Yeah, I think the, the recent uh, geopolitical events have uh, quite significant implications for the transition to net zero. Um, short term, I think it's a negative um, because coal-fired power plants, for example, uh, will not be phased out at this stage um, and even be uh, re-engaged uh, where they had closed down before. Um, with the purpose of making sure that um, we, we achieve some form of quick fix with regard to energy independence. Um, however, longer term, I think it is a strong positive for the transition to net zero because energy independence uh, can never be achieved by relying on traditional carbon-based energy. Um, so it will only be achieved, I think, with a much higher share of clean energy. And that will need significant investments. So in that way, I think longer term, this, uh, this will accelerate the pace of the transition. 
but shorter term, it will be a hiccup. What are some of the biggest challenges that businesses face when it comes to sustainability? Well, I think it depends on what kind of company you are. So I think for the large companies, um, while it is difficult to reduce their own emissions, they, they really have the plans to do so. The challenge is when they grow a lot and how can they have a growth plan with emission reductions. It, the challenge that I hear from many companies is how to manage supply chain emissions because this represents between 50 and 95% of the carbon footprint of companies. So a lot of them, half of those, come from eight global supply chains, food, construction, fashion, fast-moving consumer goods, electronics, automotive, and freight. Okay. If you are a small company, then you're part of someone else's corporate supply chain, and there the challenge is more resources, knowledge and, yeah, and, 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 and money. Yeah, I think uh, sustainability is not yet um, a driver of profits or seen as a competitive benefit. So I think we need to deal with this in a proactive way. In a way, how do the donkeys walk, the carrot and the stick? Right? So the carrot is a subsidy. Uh, it can be the uh, positive capital allocation, additional funding. Uh, the stick is carbon tax, withholding capital from, from fund, that to fund that business, uh, introduce reputational risk. But I think what is most important to, to make sure that uh, companies move to sustainability, sustainability quicker uh, is to use the shareholders meeting to force management teams to accept hard targets. So first what is needed is the delivery of a credible plan to deliver a net zero operating model for that business. And then, uh, in our engagement, focus hard on the implementation of that transition plan and to do that now and not to wait until 2030 or 2040 uh, because that will be way too late. So how important is sustainability when you're deciding to invest in a company? Now, it's very important uh, to, uh, to take into account sustainability when we invest. Um, and that starts at the very uh, early stages of, of an investment philosophy. So, um, first of all, the fiduciary duty of an asset manager is often seen as uh, making as much money as you can for your client within the investment restrictions that are given to you. We actually, in AXA investment managers, see it a little broader. We believe that part of our fiduciary duty is not just to make the most money for our clients, that best return, but also to do that without doing any harm to people and planet. Um, so that basically means that that needs to be ingrained in everything that we do. Um, to the point that we go to clients that say, yeah, but I want you to invest also in these sectors because it actually enhances potentially our return, that we will say to them, well, then we might not be the right asset manager for you because we do it in this way. So um, that means it is fully integrated in our investment philosophy, our product positioning and investment processes where engagement, uh, not just integration, but also engagement with companies um, is really the key uh, to bring our investee companies to set ambitious transition targets for themselves. How do you measure success when it comes to sustainability? I think there are a few different ways to measure success. So one of them is just saving money. If it's something like energy efficiency, you can see that companies can just save money when they get the energy efficiency measures right. So that's a kind of very clear way. Um, another is measuring against targets. So on the RE100 campaign that um, we run, we work with CDP. There's an annual disclosure process where we can see how companies are doing. And equally with um, our EV campaigns and other campaigns, we go out there annually and say, OK, how are you doing against your targets? I think one difficulty for businesses is the, the kind of culture of business often only talk about success. And actually, what's really important is to hear where things are not working. So, yeah, there are good ways to measure success, but I think it's also important for businesses to um, learn how to be transparent when things are not going well and engage others in the conversation. In just a couple of sentences, what do you think needs to be done to achieve net zero? We uh, all need to realise um, that we have an urgent problem at our hands. And if we don't fix it, we will all have a very serious problem. Um, I think that sense of urgency, the, the pain that will be felt across the world, some areas more than others, 
um, if if that starts to really become uh, uh, on on uh, visible for uh, the broader part of the population, then the right momentum will be there. I think we are reaching that tipping point. I hope it's not too late. Well, I think the, the countries around the world need to be serious on, on putting in place uh, national uh, emission reduction plans that are aligned with what the science says that they need to do. I, I think the key thing now is to get action plans in place. We've seen a lot of commitments being made. That's great. But we're not seeing enough now of the immediate plans that we need. We, business is going back and saying, OK, if that's what we look like in 2030, what do we have to do right, right now to make that happen? Amazing. Thank you. Well, that concludes our roundtable discussion. Thank you to all our speakers for joining today. And thanks to you for watching. Take care.